for uh, coming this morning and listening to us talk. Uh, so as Tony said, today I'm going to talk about the cost of amputee walking and in particular I'm going to compare um, ESR feet with satch feet. So ESR feet, for, for people that don't know, are your carbon fibre or glass fibre kind of blades that you see. You see them a lot in running uh, in, the, in the Paralympics, but we're talking about the ones that are used for walking today. And we're going to compare the cost of walking with those feet against your very traditional, very kind of basic satch foot, which stands for solid ankle cushioned heel. So it's it's very rigid and then just has a bit of cushioning in the heel. And uh, yeah, ESR feet stands for uh, energy storage and return. So it's this idea that they somehow store some energy during stance and return it uh, later on. Uh, obviously, it's not just me doing this work. So I've, there's some of my colleagues at Salford University that were involved in this research as well. Okay, just as a way of an introduction, I'm sure a lot of you will be familiar with this kind of thing, but along the bottom here we have amputation level. So from left to right, uh, on the left you've got the most severe amputations going up and up till you get to what would be normal gait. And then the grey bars we have speed. And as you'd expect, your your this is a self-selected speed, so this is a kind of typical walking speed of a, of a patient uh, the higher the level of the amputation, so the further up your leg you've been amputated, the slower you walk on average. So that's kind of expected. Likewise, the cost of walking, so the amount of energy or O2 you're using per kilogram per meter also increases. So again, that's not unexpected. The higher your level of amputation, the more energy you have to use just to, just to transport one kilogram of your body mass one meter. And what we can see here is actually there isn't a huge amount of difference between the normal and the transtibial, but then as soon as you get to things like transfemoral, so the TF amputees, then we're beginning to see a large increase in the cost of transport. So that's the effect of level of amputation on cost of transport and speed. But speed itself has an effect on this relationship. So again, if we look at the cost of transport on the left, and then we've got increasing walking speeds on the, on the x-axis, what you'll find is you have these typically U-shaped curves, which I'm sure many of you will be familiar with. And uh, we've got the black data there for some non-amputees. And you see, if we carry that on further, it will tend to come up again until we reach running speed. So you get this kind of nice U-shaped, quite flat-bottomed U-shape. And so we would typically walk somewhere around the 80 meters per minute kind of mark, because uh, that's a comfortable walking speed. We're not using very much energy. As you can see, the transtibial amputees, the red, they're, they're a bit higher than us. And then transfemoral again, so echoing what I was saying in the last slide, the higher level of amputation, the more it cost, your cost of transport increases. What you'll also notice there is I've got two lines for the transtibial amputees and two lines for the transfemoral amputees. And that's just comparing different feet types. So there's a flex foot, which is the similar to the picture A there, and a satch foot, which is B and C at the bottom. And what we can see is that level of amputation looks like it has a larger effect on the cost of transport than, uh, than the foot type used. But we kind of wanted to dig in more to what was actually going on with different feet types with the energy saving and return feet versus the satch foot, especially since manufacturers sometimes claim that these ESR feet are, are better to walk with. So when we start to look at data of comparing different feet types, so this is for transtibial amputees and it's comparing a satch foot against two different types of ESR foot. Uh, so it's two different studies by Su et al. And what you'll find is that generally the blue line, which is the satch foot, is higher than the red lines, but that's not statistically significant. So what you find in quite a lot of studies is you get this trend towards the satch foot costing more to walk than your ESR feet, but the difference is often very small. An interesting aside, if you like, is that these, these ESR feet, like the one you see in the bottom right here, are preferred by amputees for, for subjective reasons. So they'll say things like, um, my pain reduction, you know, I get reduction in the pain, they're more comfortable to walk with, they're easier to walk with, which is quite a subjective term. So that's just something to bear in mind while we talk about this. So even though we don't see any difference in the cost of transport, these feet are preferred by amputees, and I think actually by prosthetists as well. They, they prefer to uh, prescribe this kind of foot over uh, a more basic satch foot. 
Uh, on the graph on the right, you can also see some running data there, which is unusual to have amputees running with a walking foot, but, but there's some data there on it as well. Okay, carrying on. So that was that was comparing different feet and show, sort of showing individual studies. What I want to show here is how if you take data from different studies and lump them together, you'll see that you get quite different results. So I've separated out here the satch foot on the left and the flex foot on the right. And this is data from one study, the Nielsen study. And what you'll find is typically the cost of walking, like we're seeing the transtibial amputees, is higher than the non-amputees. Uh, in this case, around about 50% higher. But if I add in some data from some other studies, then what you start to get is a very messy picture. So on the left, we still have just SATCH data and non-amputee data. On the right, we have flex foot data and non-amputee data. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, it, it gets very difficult to start drawing conclusions about what's going on here. Different studies are producing very different results. And one, di one difficulty we come across when we're trying to compare different studies with each other is not many studies of, of uh, prosthetic feet actually include a non-amputee control group. So that makes comparing the results of one study with another very difficult because a non-amputee group would be one way to normalize the data, but that's often not available. And as you can see, actually, the non-amputee results themselves are variable. <clears throat> and these differences come about just to do with the group that you have, so the subject you're using in your experiment, or protocol differences, or perhaps the equipment you're using. Uh, so what we wanted to do is a way, we're trying to come up with a way to take this data and, and get something meaningful out of it, clump all the data together. So just some conclusions and in, in why we thought there was a requirement for a meta-analysis after sort of digging around in literature for a bit. This figure on the left just shows you, if you just plot the raw data, what kind of mess it is, so that we can say there's no real clear-cut trend to what's going on. One thing we spotted from the data is satch feet seem to be higher than your ESR feet, but there's, that's not often statistically significant. It's just a trend. Non-amputee results are clearly lower, but they also have quite a bit of noise in them. Uh, across the literature, is actually quite limited to transfemoral data, so that's you know we can only really talk about transtibial data for this. Uh, like I was saying before, protocol differences make a big difference. So Travalesi showed that even just taking the same group with the same feet on a treadmill and comparing that with free walking, you get very different results. So it just sort of highlights the importance of understanding your protocol. Low subject numbers, this is a common problem for, for amputee research. It's just difficult to get enough people in to do to do the experiments. And yeah, a lot of the studies are interested in comparing one foot type against another foot type so they don't include a non-amputee control group, which is something I'd like to encourage people that carry on doing this kind of research because it's not difficult. If you've already set up your protocol for amputees, it's really easy to include some non-amputees in there, and that gives that nice comparative uh, power of having that group in there. Okay, so what did we do? How did we get around this problem of the data being such a mess? So what we did is we took... There should be an arrow here, unfortunately. You can't quite see it because it's black bar. But we took the, the cost of transport with an ESR foot and we divided it by the cost of transport with a SATCH foot at every speed in, the, in every study. And the reason we did this is the SATCH foot is fairly consistent and designed by different manufacturers and it provided a baseline that was often included in the studies. So if you like, we're looking at the percentage cost of ESR feet compared to the satch foot. So we use this as a, a way to normalize our data. So the equation is at the bottom there, and I call that normalized cost of transport. So we did this for a whole bunch of studies with a whole bunch of different ESR feet. A slight caveat here is that obviously I'm lumping together all the ESR feet into, into one group, whereas there are quite significant differences in some of their designs and some of what they're intended to do. But just for this comparison, I thought that was fair. So if we carry on to the results, this is kind of the, the key result from the study. If there was no difference between the ESR feet, so the, the carbon fibre type ones, and the satch foot, you'd expect these triangles to cluster around a mean of one. But when we did the statistics, the mean is actually 0 0.973. So if you like 97% on average, the cost of walking with an ESR foot compared to a satch foot. And as you can immediately guess, that's not it's not a big difference. Although it's statistically significant, it's not a big difference. Uh, this was data collected from 10 studies. And also you'll notice that quite a few in quite a few of the studies, the ESR feet are still quite a bit above that line. 
So whilst we've got a statistically significant result that the ESR fee are more efficient on average than the SATCH fee, it's not, whether or not it constitutes a functionally significant difference is debatable because it's only a very small difference. Okay, so that leads us on to the obvious question, especially since manufacturers claim that these um, energy saving and return feet are, are more efficient for amputees to walk with. Why don't they perform better? What is it about ESR feet that aren't working? So this is two graphs from a Segal study in 2006. On the left, you have the ankle angle, and on the right, you have the ankle power. The dashed line and the solid line are two different types of prosthetic foot, and the dotted line is a non-amputee. And what becomes immediately apparent is after about 50% of the gait cycles, so the little stick man at the top, and that, that part we call push off, we can see that the healthy ankle, you get a very large uh, plantar flexion angle. So your, your ankle is, is, is flexing downwards, pushing you off, as we call it, into the next ride. Likewise, the ankle power at that point, you get a very big peak in ankle power. But with the amputee data, the peak in, peak in power is much smaller, and as you can see on the figure on the left, uh, that ankle angle that we need, that plantar flexion ankle angle, is just completely missing. And if you think about the design of most prosthetic feet, it kind of makes sense from an engineering's perspective. If the neutral angle is at 90 degrees, we want the foot, that, or what the natural ankle does, is it plantar flexes down, so you push your toes down, and you're producing a torque in that direction at the same time, and that gives you the push-off power. If you take an ESR foot and you bend it in that direction, it naturally wants to return back to its neutral position. And this is the exact opposite of what we want at this point in the gait cycle. We want plantar flexion angle to be increasing and a plantar flexion moment. So it's something inherent in the design of ESR feet that they just can't provide this push-off power. Uh, so what, what, do we, what, what do you think we need to do about it? Well, first of all, let's just have a look at what an intact ankle does and how an intact ankle produces this push of power. So this is a study by Ishikawa, and they looked at tendon and muscle fibers in the, the Achilles tendon and some of the muscle, muscles that are connected to it, and they looked at how much of that push of power might have been provided by the tendon. So that dashed line there you can see is showing that the tendon actually produces most of the power available for push off. And it does this, we think, by as, during stance as your foot comes over, your, sorry, your leg comes over your foot, you're stretching that tendon, you get some strain energy stored in it, and then they call it a kind of catapult-like mechanism. But towards the end, the energy that's been stored in the, in the Achilles tendon is released, and that powers your push-off into the next stance. What exactly push-off power does is still kind of an open debate in, in the, the literature. Some people think it's about redirecting the center of mass, so shifting your weight from your foot that's pushing off onto your other stance foot. Other people think it might be about accelerating your leg into swing, so it's, it's a catapulting your leg forward ready for its next stance. Uh, I'm not sure people are 100% sure what it does, but clearly we think it's missing in amputees, and we're, and we're thinking of ways that we can actually get it back and improve amputee walking. And just as some evidence that re-establishing re, uh, uh, that push-off power that's missing in amputee data might actually be useful, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of the Biome Foot designed by Hugh Hare's group at, at uh, MIT. And so this is a study uh, he published in Proceedings B, and it showed that if you take uh, the red lines there are amputees with a, a normal prosthetic ESR foot, the blue diamonds are, are amputees walking with the biome foot, and the green are non-amputees. And what he showed is their foot, although it's a powered foot, so it's not passive, it has a battery and it has a motor, one of the things it does is it restores that push-off power. And when you compare the metabolic cost of amputees using that foot with non-amputees, the results are not statistically significantly different, i.e. the amputees are being brought back from where they would be with a red line if they were walking with a typical ESR or, or other prosthetic foot. They're being brought back much more in line with the cost of transport for non-amputees. So this is really encouraging. This, this to me says that if we can re-get uh, amputees and their prosthetic feet producing this push-off power, we have a chance of bringing their cost of walking back in line 
with the cost of walking of non-amputees. A slight caveat to all this stuff is we have to remember that this is in a controlled environment on a very flat surface, whereas in the real world, if you, when you send them out, amputees out into the real world, they have very different surfaces to deal with and slopes, but it's at least an encouraging result to start with. So what are the conclusions from the talk? The raw data, if you just look at it as it is, is very messy and it's difficult to interpret. Studies tend to provide contrasting results, and that's due to protocol differences, low subject numbers. Uh, hence the need for the meta-analysis we conducted. More studies of prosthetic fee, I think, need to include control groups so that we can actually non-amputee control groups, so we can actually compare how these prosthetic feet are performing to non-amputees. ESR feet are statistically more efficient to walk with than SATCH feet. And now, as you remember at the start, ESR stands for energy storage and return, and this idea that they improve the metabolic cost of transport. I think this is a bit of a misnomer, but it's kind of stuck in the literature now. They really don't do their intended performance. Even though they're supposed to store and return energy, they really aren't doing that. The differences that are there are very small, and it's debatable whether they are functionally significant differences. But like the other caveat I said, amputees prefer these feet for different reasons. So if you're prescribing these feet or you're wanting to encourage their use, I think we need to stop talking about metabolic cost differences and talk about comfort, pain reduction, those kind of things that really matter to the amputee. And the lack of push-off power we think is a problem both for the ESR feet and the SATCH feet and feet with more active plantar flexion, like those biome results I showed you, uh, is, is the way I think we need to go to, to reduce the cost of transport and amputees back more in line with non-amputees. Okay, thank you for listening. Do we have any questions I can answer at the moment? Thank you, Jude. <laughs> so if you have some questions, then if you can come to the microphone and state your, your name. Designation. <laughs> Any questions? I have one, James. Okay, Tony. So, um, that was a really an excellent presentation. Thank you. Makes, uh, we think there's a process uh, about prescription. Yes. You prescribe. Yeah. And the reasons why you prescribe, it, and I particularly liked the idea that, in actual fact, we may be prescribing these for energy considerations, but it may actually be beneficial to the patient in other ways. Yeah. I wonder in your meta-analysis, and we read uh, some of the literature in this area, is it is it fair to group the studies together? Um, yeah. The inclusion criteria in some of the studies is, is pretty woolly, uh, and uh, you know it also the alignment we uh, is is often not described in its you know, fullness. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you gather data from the literature, you're always you've always got this problem that you have to. You know, you're trying to you're trying to lump together data from different studies, which have different aims and objectives, use different groups. I think it's fair <laughs> to lump them together because, at the end of the day, I feel like the problems, like you say, with maybe differences in alignment and different kind of groups, should come out in the wash. And actually, I expected to see no difference between the ESR feet and the SATCH feet. I expected when you plotted all that data. It to be a mess again and we, we you know wouldn't have wouldn't be able to say anything okay they're not statistically significant so i was surprised when to find that there was this statistical di difference even though it was very small so i suppose you could say yeah clumping them together like that is valid in the fact that we actually found a result that we weren't expecting and like you see in terms of in terms of prescription i think we need to move away from talking about esr feet in terms of energy performance and start talking them and the other benefits they have which which clearly amputees do prefer them and talk about things like pain management and that kind of stuff okay <laughs> enthralled <laughs> thank you cheers